Today marks two years since Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. This compilation of videos tracks the development of the war from the very first day of the invasion all the way through to the Ukrainian withdrawal from Advivka last week. This is the war in Ukraine in 15 defining moments. Мною принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. Ее цель – защита людей, которые на протяжении 8 лет подвергаются издевательствам, геноциду со стороны киевского режима.
даже не вздумать двигаться. Тихо шел. И мне это самое ценное. These are the scenes following the aftermath of an overnight Russian shelling in a Ukrainian village, an innocent casualty in what wasn't a strategically significant target. которые не понимают, которых нет информации в России, что здесь творится. И их детей тоже здесь убивают. Их убивают здесь детей. Они пушечное мясо. Мы пушечное мясо. Они пушечное. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has forced more than a million people to flee the country. And while Vladimir Putin shows no sign of agreeing to a ceasefire, his military have instead pressed forward shelling dozens of towns and locals. But, with its vastly superior troop numbers and equipment, why hasn't Russia won its war with Ukraine more than a week after Putin's first orders to cross the frontier? I want to say that the operation is in strict accordance with the graphic, the plan. All the tasks are managed in a bid to cut off Ukraine's access to the sea, Russian forces managed to force their way into the port city of Kherson, a small prize compared with Putin's desire to capture Kiev. For days, a massive Russian military convoy has reportedly sat stalled outside of the capital, waiting for orders to enter the city that have not been forthcoming. Its lack of progress has raised questions about Russia's war planning, after their trucks, troops and weapons have been plagued by fuel shortages and logistical challenges. But US officials warned against any sweeping conclusions that this signals a setback for the Russians. While it has stalled the assault on Kiev for now, officials believe Russia will adjust, compensate and overcome such setbacks. Before they invaded, US intelligence predicted Moscow would immediately mobilise its vast air power. But days into the invasion, their warplanes haven't been used as much as expected, baffling military experts. Troops on the ground also face difficulties at every turn. Ukrainian soldiers have mounted a stiffer-than-expected resistance to Russian forces, and they won't go down without a fight. He thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he met with a wall, a wall of strength he never anticipated or imagined. He met the Ukrainian people. As hundreds of lives are lost on both sides of the war, it's clear Putin won't stop until he gets what he wants. But as the death toll and costs mount on his side of the battle, concerns have been raised about how far he is willing to go. Russia may be ramping up its invasion of Ukraine, but on the ground a sinister secret is making itself known. Emerging from the shadows are a Kremlin-funded private military company known for its heinous acts in war zones like Syria and Venezuela. Moscow has deployed up to a thousand mercenaries from a paramilitary organization known as the Wagner Group. The group's experienced fighters have been ever-present in Ukraine since the annexation of Crimea in 2014 aiding separatist forces in Donetsk and Luhansk. 
Named after Adolf Hitler's favourite musician, the Wagner Group has been accused of war crimes for allegedly murdering prisoners in Libya. And under the cover of plausible deniability, these private companies help keep Russia's military operations and their exact number of losses secret. And once this information reached the Ukrainian government, Kiev then declared a 36-hour hard curfew so Ukrainian defense forces could sweep the streets looking for Russian saboteurs. Putin's ally Yevgeny Prigozhin allegedly owns the group, but both he and the Russian president deny any connection with it. But it's not just Russia employing mercenaries to join the fight. Far-right street militia group Azov Battalion has been supporting Ukrainian armed forces in the Donbass region for close to a decade. It's accused of fostering neo-Nazi ideologies, which have been referred to by Vladimir Putin as one of the motives for what he calls the denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine. Its 900 fighter-strong unit has fought on the front line in Donetsk since Russia's first invasion in 2014. The UN has accused the regiment of violating humanitarian law by embedding weapons and forces in civilian buildings, displacing residents and looting their properties in 2016. It's claimed the Azov Battalion has attracted fighters from across the world, including from Brazil, France, the US and the UK. And flooding in from far and wide are also volunteers for Ukraine's International Legion, where 20,000 fighters from 52 countries are helping to defend Ukraine from Russia's military advances. These include thousands of troops from former Soviet countries, fearing their nation could be next if Ukraine falls. The British Army says a number of its soldiers have disobeyed orders and gone AWOL, fearing they've also joined Ukraine's fight. The Army says it's strongly encouraging its missing troops to return, but their disappearance comes after Foreign Secretary Liz Truss said she would support UK citizens who wanted to help fight. What's becoming clear is this is not a Russian invasion being repelled exclusively by Ukrainian troops. It's a worldwide military effort to attack and defend Europe's largest country. A democratically elected Jewish president accused of leading a Nazi state by his autocratic adversary. Almost 80 years after the fall of the Third Reich, Russian President Vladimir Putin still claims to be at war with National Socialism. His stated goals of denationalizing and denazifying Ukraine were, at least publicly, his motivation for a brutal invasion that has already claimed thousands of lives. This line has been peddled by Kremlin officials ever since Russian boots first set foot on Ukrainian soil. From Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to Russia's UN Ambassador Vasily Nebensha, the claim that Ukraine is a danger to itself is dominating the Russian-speaking world. But is there any truth to these allegations? Or is it merely a scapegoat to justify Putin's war goals? For much of the early 20th century, Ukraine suffered under the regime of one dictator or another. In the 1930s, it endured the Holodomor, a man-made Soviet famine supposedly orchestrated by Joseph Stalin to eliminate the Ukrainian independence movement. Millions died of starvation and some even turned to cannibalism, even as the USSR rejected foreign offers of grain and seed to lift the famine. Later, Operation Barbarossa saw the Wehrmacht sweep through Eastern Europe, imposing a brutal regime of suppression and persecution as they pushed towards Russia. Though initially greeted as liberators as the avowed enemy of Poland and the USSR, this illusion was quickly shattered. Quick to implement its racial policies, the Nazi death squads exterminated well over a million Jews and Soviets in just two years. The Second World War, known in Russia as the Great Patriotic War and in Ukraine as the Soviet-German War, left its mark on Eastern Europe. 
Adolf Hitler's orders to create a zone of annihilation in 1943, coupled with the Soviet military's scorched earth policy in 1941, meant Ukraine lay in ruins. By the time Berlin fell in 1945, 6.8 million Ukrainians were dead, over a third of the total Russian civilian death toll. Today, Ukraine's brutal past manifests in myriad ways. One historical figure who has emerged as a hero in post-Maidan Ukraine is Stepan Bandera, a Nazi collaborator and leader of Ukraine's ultra-nationalist movement. A politician and theorist of the militant wing of the far-right Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, Bandera welcomed the arrival of the Nazis in Ukraine having helped pave the way with espionage and sabotage. Some Ukrainians hail him as a liberator who fought against the Soviet, Polish and Nazi states while trying to establish an independent Ukraine. Others condemn him as a fascist and a war criminal who was, together with his followers, largely responsible for massacres of Polish civilians and partially for the Holocaust in Ukraine. Despite his controversial past, Bandera is still a celebrated figure. A torchlit procession is held across Ukraine every year on January the 1st. In Kyiv, a Stepan Bandera Avenue has appeared, and in 2010 he was awarded the title of Hero of Ukraine by then President Viktor Yushchenko. Offshoots of Bandera's organization of Ukrainian nationalists exist to this day. The Azov Battalion, a former paramilitary organization recently incorporated into Ukraine's National Guard, has been embroiled in controversy for its use of Nazi symbols. Accused of harboring National Socialist sympathies, it's been internationally condemned as a terrorist organization. Some even claim its slogan, Ukraine above all, is directly derived from the Nazis, Deutschland über alles. Critics point to rampant anti-Semitism in the movement, and its so-called Hitler Youth-style training camps for Ukrainian children. But to the Kremlin, the ultra-nationalist education of children extends far beyond the boot camps and far-right marches. Ukrainian schools, Moscow says, is the training ground for the neo-Nazis of the future. They claim that all references to the Second World War have been completely scrubbed from Ukrainian history textbooks. In the exam topics for 2020, only a certain Soviet-German war was mentioned, and any references to Hitler, Bandera, or the Holocaust, Moscow says, is diligently avoided. But even though some elements of the country have been entangled with one of history's most loathsome political movements, the West still stands with Ukraine. Every day that Putin ratchets up his assault against the Ukrainian people with scorched earth zeal, the Russian president's smear of his counterpart in Kyiv looks increasingly hypocritical. Рух наших воїнів на різних напрямках фронту продовжується. На цей час в рамках активних дій від початку вересня вже звільнено близько 2000 км нашої території. Російська армія цими днями демонструє найкраще, що вміє. Показує спину. І зрештою це непоганий вибір для них втікати. Окупанта в Україні місця немає і не буде. Уже нас полихає. Хлопці, помашемо. Слава Україні! Утро 
данный год, значит, полностью все это реконструирую, вы видели на картинке, в каком он был состоятельный. Пройдем, а сейчас вот абсолютно нормально, на 200 мест, которые все федеральные стройки строят, военно-строительная компания, автодор. Вообще активно ведет работу. Вообще в городе в этом году, вот где-то к сентябрю, в октябрь, народ, кстати, ходит. Прямо все мы с отцом Владимиром встречаемся. Полностью вся концепция готова, доработаем, вам покажем. Мы, мы только по телевизору Очень вас часто. только раз видели. Ну ничего, так на, надо же начинать да. знакомиться поближе. Все. Это все. мая 23 -го года 20.05.2023 сегодня по полудню в 12 часов полностью был взят Бахмут Сегодня они находятся в Бахмуте. В каких точках делиться не буду, но это говорит про то, что Бахмут не охоплен на сегодня Российской Федерации. Никаких двух или трех тлумачений этому не может быть. For whatever reason, whether the troops there are just now exhausted or whether they've lost so many troops they can't seem to hold either side, the Ukrainians have discovered that you know, the, the, the sides of Bakhmut are much weaker for the Russians and they're beginning to push them back. Ukrainians thought, how do we actually make the Russians expend force? We know they want to take Bakhmut. And other towns like Advika too, there were a few other towns that seemed to be obsessing the Russians. And therefore, as horrible as it is, we have to fight for these cities because that's going to keep the Russians attacking and keep the Russians losing um, soldiers and equipment. And in that sense, it seems to have done the horrible thing it was supposed to do. Now, it doesn't look like this is part of a Ukrainian counteroffensive. It was almost like the Ukrainians just took advantage of the fact that actually the Russian lines were weak and did it. But I think it's a sign that the Russian army has suffered such high losses and is so worn out around Bakhmut that it's, um, it's going nowhere forward. That's it. It cannot go forward anymore. You know, taking Bakhmut was basically all it could do.
командующий объединенной группировкой войск, начальник Генерального штаба Вооруженных сил Российской Федерации, генерал армии Герасимов, в этот период находился на одном из передовых пунктов управления на данном направлении. В стране 10 тысяч генералов, надо оставить 200. Этих генералов заставить бегать в бронежилетах по переднему, по переднему краю. И если генералы начнут погибать, это не говорит о том, что все в армии плохо. Это значит, что они суются туда, куда нужно суваться. Нет, иди отсюда! Куда ты идешь, ты утонешь? The international community may not yet agree on what caused the Nova Kohovka Dam to collapse, but nobody can deny the immeasurable suffering it has caused. In Kherson, this woman rescues her dogs from what remains of her home. Her story is one of thousands on both sides of the Dnipro River. Я не знаю, что делать. Ну как можно было это сделать? Ну как бы, ну ладно, война. Вы воюете, вы солдаты, вы прорывать дегес. Но это же это уже вообще, я не знаю, это варварство какое-то просто варварство. The grim reality is that the worst effects of this disaster may be yet to come. The sheer magnitude of the catastrophe will only become fully realized in the coming days. Additionally, any uncontrolled decrease in the water level of the reservoir may negatively affect the safety of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The damage caused by the dam's destruction means that life will become intolerably harder for those already suffering from the conflict. And the consequences of not being able to deliver assistance to the millions of people affected by the flooding in these areas are potentially catastrophic and as yet unmeasured. The rescue efforts are now well underway, both by Ukrainian authorities and by Russia in the parts of Ukraine it currently occupies. Even in the face of this disaster, the war rages on. Incredibly, these rescue efforts have to stop so everyone can take shelter from yet more shelling. Back at the UN, the message from the US, UK and France was clear. Whatever caused the collapse of the dam, the root cause of all the terrible suffering of the Ukrainian and Russian people alike is Putin's terrible war. I want to make absolutely clear. It was Russia that started this war. It was Russia that occupied this area of Ukraine. And it was Russian forces that took over the dam illegally last year and have been occupying ever since.
A high-stakes standoff between Yegevny Prigozhin, the head of the notorious Wagner private mercenary group, and the Russian military is rapidly escalating. In a bold move, Prigozhin has announced that his Wagner fighters have crossed the border from Ukraine into Russia and are prepared to confront Moscow's military head-on. Russia's FSB security service responded by initiating a criminal case against Prigozhin, urging the Wagner forces to disregard his orders and arrest him. Prigozhin, once an ally of Putin, has engaged in a bitter feud with Moscow in recent months, while his criticism of the Defense Ministry's leadership gained attention and seemingly enjoyed immunity. In a recently recorded audio message shared on Telegram, Prigozhin confirmed that his fighters had entered the city of Rostov in southern Russia, determined to remove any obstacles in their path. We are in the stab at 7 o'clock 30 minutes in the morning, under control of the military objects in Rostov, in particular. Footage appearing on social media has claimed to show Russian troops in the area of Rostov too. Prigozhin accused Russia's military leadership of a devastating air strike that resulted in the deaths of numerous Wagner troops. He pledged to hold those responsible accountable for their actions. In the evening, on the social media, from the name of Evgeny Prigozhin, it was actively spread the information about the fact that the armed forces of Russia had hit the legs of the Wagner troops. Besides, there were calls for the to take the leadership of the Defense Ministry. Despite denying any intention to stage a military coup, a series of intense audio messages, albeit unverified, suggested that Prigozhin's militia, comprising of around 25,000 fighters, had set their sights on toppling the leadership of Russia's defense ministry in Moscow. Это не военный переворот. Это марш справедливости. Наши действия никак не мешают войскам. Нас 25 тысяч, и мы идем разбираться, почему в стране творится беспредел. 25 000 ожидает как тактический резерв, а стратегический резерв – это вся армия и вся страна. Все, кто хочет, присоединяйтесь. Надо заканчивать с этим безобразием. The rapidly escalating tensions prompted heightened security measures across government buildings, transportation hubs, and critical locations in Moscow. General Sergei Sorovkin, deputy commander of Russia's Ukraine campaign, made a direct appeal to the Wagner fighters himself in a video message. This standoff, shrouded in uncertainty, still presents the most significant domestic crisis for President Putin since the initial deployment of Russian troops to Ukraine last year. Делают это героически. Знаю, сегодня еще раз ночью говорил с командующими всех направлений. Обращаюсь и к тем, кого обманом или угрозами втянули в преступную авантюру, толкнули на путь тяжкого преступления. Meanwhile, in Kyiv, Ukrainian officials revealed that their counteroffensive against Russia's invasion has yet to reach its full strength, further adding to Vladimir Putin's woes. With Ukraine's recent gains on the battlefield marking their first substantial progress in seven months, the focus now shifts to breaking through Russia's meticulously prepared defense lines fortified over the last few months. As tensions continue to escalate and the situation remains highly volatile, both sides are on high alert. обсуждения моей ликвидации для обсуждающих жив я или нет как у меня дела сейчас выходные вторая половина августа 23 -го года нахожусь в африке поэтому любители обсуждения моей ликвидации интимной жизни зар заработков там или еще чего нибудь Собственно говоря, все в порядке. Работаем. Температура плюс 50. Все как мы любим. Чувака Вагнер проводит РПД. Делает Россию еще более... Спасибо!
Поїхали, поїхали! А где противогазы? Потери противника в боях за Авдеевку в течение последних суток составили более полутора тысяч военнослужащих. Под непрерывным огневым воздействием российских войск, лишь отдельным разрозненным формированием украинских боевиков, удалось спешно покинуть Авдеевку, бросив при этом вооружение военных техник. Пошел, пошел, пошел.